Go ahead. I'm on a Zoom there, you okay? I'm gonna mute everybody too. Oh, good. Hey everybody, hello, and thank you. Yeah. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, some recollections. And, um, you know, it always happens when you pick a topic like six weeks in advance. So, you know, I mean, I don't think about it then. I wait until like the morning of or the day of. And uh, a, a true confession is that I reminded myself uh, earlier today that I'm doing this tonight. And it's a good thing I looked at my calendar because otherwise I might have been. Uh, watching a Bonanza reruns or something. Uh, instead, um, you may end up having preferred that I had done that, but hopefully not. So uh, um, I, I be, you know, I, I, thinking about, you know, originally this was supposed to be a, a session on, um, it was originally supposed to be a session on uh, specific uh, memories of my time as president of the rabbinical assembly, I may bring in some of those, but that's not going to be my entire focus. I figured, especially at this point of uh, of you know of, of career end, actually Beth David career end, it made more sense to generalize and go back to some early rabbi memories. Uh, and um, so I I decided I, I've always I, I did something kind of weird today. I checked and I have a huge number of computer records on my computer and um I've uh and I I look back to see how many I have on my computer um how many funeral records I have they go back on my Macintosh computers which is this I'm in my 10th now I think but um and I I did the I checked all of the files because it's alphabetical I have windows and a to B, C to D, et cetera, about 15 different win windows. And there are quite a few in each window. So I discovered that on my computer, going back to 1988, that's when I first got my, my, got my first Macintosh. Um, that was uh, in the summer of 1988. Um, since then I have 2,064 funeral records. So I did the, I didn't have the others, the pre-Mac records. I don't have access to them. They're in the office. I'm not in the office right now. Um, so I did a calculation based on the number I, of, I would have per year. So I ended up basically with uh, a figure that since the beginning of my career, I've done 2,306 funerals, um, which I thought it was around 2,000. So it's a bit more than I thought in memory. And um, there are probably a few that I didn't have records for because there are some that I ended up doing with. I didn't have records for various reasons. I couldn't meet with the family. Uh, where they were very small. I had one funeral where I was the only person there. That was a rather interesting funeral. I enjoyed my eulogy because I was talking to myself, which I like to do. But um, it uh, it occurred to me, you know, so I just started to think back. Um, and, you know, I've had since uh, my last official public day at Beth David, which was the second day of Shavuot, I've done three funerals since then. Uh, and um, unfortunately, uh, at least one of them was terribly tragic and the other two yeah, every, sad, not as tragic, but sad, and uh, um, like really sad. Uh, and um, most funerals are sad. There aren't too many that are happy. Um, and I could tell you a story about that in a minute, uh, about, about a happy funeral, but that's another story. So uh, I, I thought back at my very first funeral. And I, I have to be honest, this goes back to 1980. It was either 81 or 82, my very first year at Beth David wasn't a Beth David member. Uh, I did very few funerals in my first two and a half years because my predecessor of blessed memory, Rabbi Pappenheim, never went away. And he did all the funerals. I did like one or two funerals each of those first couple of years, as opposed to the average of 60, which I maintained in the, in the ensuing years. But I remember the very first one, it was, it was, not, a, uh, it was not a member of uh, Beth David. It was a member of Shar Shalom. I don't recall the name of the person. I'd have to check files which I'm in the office. Um, and this is the, the story where it goes like this. Again, I was into I was assistant rabbi Beth David. I'd been at Beth David for a few months, and I don't remember if it was in the fall or the winter. So it was either uh, 1981 or 1982. And I got a call from my friend and colleague Rabbi Binder, 
So the, the Kachurugs are here who will remember Rabbi Binder and then maybe some other people who've migrated to us from Shar Shalom. And, uh, you know, he was a, he is a wonderful colleague. I periodically see him in Israel. Um, but he was, uh, I believe, the first rabbi of Shar Shalom. And um, he called me, asked me to, and I was new in town, relatively new in town. But would I do him a favor? Could I cover for him for a funeral? He was going to be away. And I hesitated. I really, I'd never done a funeral before. And um, I was nervous. I really hesitated. And, I, and he said, do it. You know, you're going to be fine. It should be okay. Do it. And I did it. And I'd say the person survived, but he didn't because he had died. But the family survived and it worked. And that was my first of 2,306 funerals going back 40 years. But what sticks with me when I think about that occurrence, I had one other funeral that year, by the way, which was a Beth David member, because that was the one day that Rabbi Pappenheim did go away. He had an out-of-town wedding that day. Happened to be, at the time, my brother-in-law's wedding. And um, he had to leave town. And so he had to miss a funeral of a member. Um, I think Elise might be on this. Uh, it was Elise, uh, really, her grandfather. And Rabbi Pappenheim was very upset because he was going to miss a funeral. He never missed a funeral, but I, that was my second funeral. But I remember feeling, you know, I, I just recalled the nervousness starting out. So I've always had sympathy for a newly starting out rabbi who has never done one before. Because the first time you do it, you are nervous. Am I going to say something wrong? Am I going to mess it up? Am I going to, um, uh, is it going to be a, a travesty? Am I never going to live this down? Um, but it happened. And so 40 years later and 2,305 funerals later, it were, you know, I, I got used to it and Rabbi Binder was right. And he, you know, just you do it and you're going to be fine. And I was fine. Um, but I, I just think back to, you know, the years of inexperience at the beginning of my career. I look back at some of my really early sermons, which at the time I liked. And I look at them now, I could never deliver them now um, because life experience has changed me. And I, I, I would not be saying the same things I said 40 years ago. Part of it's because of history. The world has changed and no rabbi would be saying what he said 40 years, what she said 40 years ago. I, I, I gave away, I had all of these uh, anthologies of sermons by great rabbis. I've given almost all of them away because I haven't used them for 25 years because what they said in the 1950s doesn't really resonate. It's If you want to write a history of the, of the rabbinate and of rabbinic preaching, it would be great, but it's not helpful because none of this would make sense anymore. It's, um, it just doesn't work anymore on a whole variety of levels. Um, and um, so, that, so we, we see the, tr the change and the transformation. So what I, what I would have said then, the way I would have said it then would be different than the way I would say it now. So that's part of evolution. And I, I'm, I'm beginning to see and try to understand um, how I have evolved over the decades. And a lot of you on this screen have helped me in that process of evolution. Um, and I, I've always appreciated good feedback. Um, I remember a on a couple of levels, I'm going to cite one of our late past presidents, the late Max Goody, Allah Shalom. And many of you who've been around the Beth David community or the Toronto Zionist community where he was very active for decades, president of the Canadian Zionist Federation, and very, very involved in, in the Zionist world. All those kids live in Israel, and most of his kids live in Israel. And um, Max used to give me critiques of my sermons. Most of them he really liked. But if he didn't like one, I would listen because he was very honest. Um, and um, I once, you know, in my exuberance of my youth, probably when I was 29 or 30, I gave this sermon based on how wonderful it is to be old. Um, you know, I really had a real great knowledge of insight into what it's like to be old when I was 29 or 30. I really knew a lot about that, of course. And I talked about, you know, the, you know, to give an example, I think I was talking about Avraham Avinu being Zakain, that Avraham was old, and what does that mean? And how, you know, the, the word uh, zikna is a sign of respect in Jewish tradition. On, on buses, there's a sign in the front seats. It says, Bipne sevat takum, stand before the elderly, let them sit. In other words, that it's really cool to be old. And uh, so Max said to me at Kiddush after that sermon, he said, Rabbi, that sermon could only be given by a young person. <laughs> so that stuck with me. 
And that was the first and last sermon I ever taught, gave about the, the beauty of being old and how wonderful it is to be old. Um, as I've got ever as I've approached, you know, that stage of life, and it didn't happen last week. It's been happening gradually over time. I, I kind of understand what he what he meant. Um, one of the most insightful moments of my career of my life was on a New York subway. That was a time when we used to be able to take an airplane somewhere and travel somewhere and get on a subway somewhere and do things that we don't haven't done for a long time. And uh, so I remember this is. Four or five years ago, I'm on a New York subway. I'm sitting, I'm, I'm standing, it was crowded. And a young woman, maybe in her 20s, looks to me and says, Would you like to sit? And I nearly, I, to me, that was the most, you know, uh, uh, you know, she was trying to be, she was nice, it was wonderful, but I was very, very, it was painful because then I realized, my God, I'm not, I'm one of the old people now. And, you know, I'm the one who used to get up and offer people. So I said, thank you. No, I'm fine. I'm good. But it was just, it, it got to, you know, you get that different perspective. Um, and 20 years ago, when one of, um, I was meeting with a wedding couple and they, 20 years ago, and they said, do you have any grandchildren? Oh, okay. You know, but, but it's, so part of the growth period is recognizing, you know, when, when, sometimes when you, when you're dealing with a subject, you kind of learn at a certain point, Deal with things you really know about. That took me a while to catch on to that. Like talk about what you really know. Don't talk about things that you're not really that familiar with, and 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 don't get too deep, deeply involved in it. Other aspects of transformation that um, occurred. Although I should mention this because I did talk about how many funerals I did. I believe I've done about eighteen hundred weddings. Funerals went out over <laughs> weddings, unfortunately, but there's still quite a few of those. But I don't have those exact records in front of me. So um, what? Um, so, so what I, um, you know, what I find also is that, um, you know, again, it, it, it's helpful to, you know, what you tell you, what you talk about in after life experience is very different than what you talk about when you're kind of entering the world new and fresh and don't really have the experience that you will, will acquire over years and you're not going to be able to approach a subject with the same level of depth or the same grasp on, on reality that you would have had you gone through the life experience. So um, I, you know, go back to some of my, you know, earlier years, and I'm not the only rabbi who was in this situation. I would, you know, I would give sermons on intermarriage that I would not give today. Um, and um, because when you recognize that things are not abstract to people and um, everybody, um, you know, all of us in a sense, almost virtually all of us have people who are very close to us, usually family or others who are, who have, you know, married out of the faith or who have, uh, who have you know, basically uh, pushed the envelope of, uh, uh, of uh, Jewish continuity a little bit. And you also realize you reach a point where you say, I'm going to be speaking to 100, 200, 300, 400 people, whether it's or it's of the Yantaf more. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to, I'm not there to just make everyone feel wonderful and comfortable and happy and think everything is terrific. But on the other hand, people are coming for comfort. And I don't believe that it is uh, my responsibility or obligation or my mission to make people feel worse leaving shul than they felt coming into shul. Um, I want them not necessarily to not be concerned about things about which they should be concerned, not to look for ways in which they can improve their, their life or their standing or their Jewishness, but finding a way also to be at peace and not be filled with uh, anxiety and, 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 and uh, insecurity and feeling a sense of failure as a Jew, as a human being, so when you come out as a, you know, a new out of the seminary, you want to change the world and you want to shake things up and um, be critical and push people. And then you kind of realize as the years pass that that's not your primary function as a rabbi. Um, you're not there necessarily, you're not there to uh, cause hurt. You're not there to exacerbate pain. You don't want to increase people's anxiety, but you want to, you want to be able to suggest that 
there is a path, there is a way to go. And I would say, by the way, that some of the happiest moments I have been have been in situations such as the one I'm just alluding to, where a family, where parents have come to me to talk about their distress because a child is in a relationship or about to marry or has married somebody of another faith and, and um, they don't know what to do. Right? This doesn't happen as much anymore because the world has evolved in that way for better or for worse. But, you know, and I, I, but people are, you know, don't, I don't get the, I haven't gotten those visits from parents as often as I used to or those calls. But what I would say is, you know, take a deep breath, but also don't, you know, you know, someone would say, should I invite my son and his non-Jewish partner for a Shabbos dinner? So then I would say, you know, I would say, why not? Why wouldn't you do that? Because you want to keep them close. You don't know what will happen. You don't know what the future will bring. And it might bring you Jewish grandchildren, no matter what the situation is right now. And that has happened in many cases where it didn't look so positive for the Jewish future, where it, it does now. And the, the Pew study that just came out in the US last week kind of intimates that as well as, the, as there being a, um, even in, in the way where the US, the intermarriage rate is very high. It's like the, the latest in, out of the, aside from the Orthodox world, it's like 72%. Uh, it's in the, the 20, the, the low 30s in the conservative movement, it's in the 60s in the reform movement, and, and, and in the 90s in the, those who are unaffiliated, very, very high. But it's still, it's really high. But they were saying, interestingly, to the surprise of many of the sociologists, the percentage of kids in those households that are being raised Jewish is quite high. So sometimes, you know, we've got to find ways of hanging on to hope and that's kind of what I've, I've learned in terms of what I should, the message I should be delivering, not to despair, not to be filled with this faint sense of failure, but to look for ways in which you can bring success, even when things don't look so promising. And that does happen. And I've seen a lot of examples of that happening and not in every case, but in many, many cases. So that is something that, um, that can, um, I, I think, give us, a, give us hope for the future. And, and I have to say that, um, you know, and we're, in, we're obviously in very challenging times right now um, as Jews, as supporters of the state of Israel, for sure. The rise of anti-Semitism, very scary what's happening, particularly in the U.S., but uh, here as well, uh, in terms of overt anti-Semitism, it's really scary right now. Um, and uh, it's the first time that I can ever remember that uh, Observant Jews are being warned not to wear a kippot in public in American cities. That's been the case in Europe for a long time, but not in the US. I was a student in New York for five years, living on the outskirts of Harlem, wore a kippah all the time and never felt a moment of fear. Uh, not the case today and it's, it's, it is frightening. But even in these um, challenging moments, that I think what I've learned through my experience has been to retain that link to optimism that I think uh, we've gone through a lot and we will go through a lot, but we've come, but we are strong and we are vibrant and we are determined to, uh, to have a future. So I, uh, going back to some lighter matters, it occurred to me, I, I did some thinking in terms of, I'm supposed to like look at fragments of memory and re recollection. So I, it occurs to me that I have served in my career with five cantors and five ritual directors. Interesting, I didn't, didn't occur to me until I did the calculation and put pen to paper that um, it's five and five. So I don't know if that was destined to be. So I, um, uh, I, guess, I guess it's seven and a half cantors and seven and a half ritual directors to every um, you know, decade of my, of my service. Although the, you know, some have been longer term than others. And the two that are current, thankfully, uh, Cantor Marshall Loomer and Michael Rubin have been the longest tenured ritual directors in my term of service. Um, but I'll just go back and mention some of the names that will resonate with most of you. Um, I, when I came here, the Cantor was Ephraim Sapir, a love of Shalom. And then Cantor Meersdorf, Cantor Zingboim, Cantor Rottner, and Cantor Loomer. I hope I'm not leaving anyone up, but I believe those are the five. And five ritual directors, the late Justin Frum, a love of Shalom. Um, Alan Sokolov, who's now Cantor Alan Sokolov in the New York area. Um, Lauren Hannock, now at Beth Sedek. Asher Tannenbaum, now in Montreal. And uh, Michael Rubin, now at Beth David. 
So uh, it is interesting that, um, you know, I, I've uh, had, uh, and I think it's 21 presidents, Andy, you mentioned that uh, the event a few weeks ago, I think you were the 21st president that uh, has uh, had the privilege of meeting the rabbi of the congregation or the misfortune, however you look at it. Uh, but uh, so it's, but it, it just does suggest the, uh, the passing of time. And I could, I'm not going to, I could tell stories about each one of those individuals. Some of them are quite funny. Um, and, um, but uh, uh, some of them are not so funny, uh, but they've, they've been, uh, each one could, uh, if I ever write memoirs and I was gonna be honest in memoirs, I could have a chapter on, on many of those individuals with whom I have, uh, I have worked over time. So um, let me reflect a little bit on, and I will, by the way, um, at some point, um, I leave a little bit of room for questions if there are going to be any, I don't know if there will be. Uh, so one of the, um, let, let me talk a bit about outside involvement, which you know has been um, significant in my, in my career and certainly in the uh, latter 20 years of my career. Or, um, you know, I've been active in the in the rabbinical assembly uh, over um, the decades and extremely active, as it were. Uh, and my first, I, I've been on a lot of committees from my early years in the rabbinate and stuff. I've been involved, but my first major role was uh, chairing, being asked to chair the convention that took place in Israel on the 50th anniversary of Israel, 1998. That was a you know that was quite the event. That was a, a major uh, activity, uh, and um, it was also a very high profile convention. We had the prime minister. Uh, no, I, I'm I, the first one I mentioned was was uh, Justin Fromm. Uh, I see Jerry Bagelman mentioning Justin Fromm. He was the first one I mentioned. Maybe I, I maybe I didn't. I, 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 may, I may have mumbled it, but you know, he was the first ritual director that I served under. Uh, so. Um, the um, uh, that convention was, uh, you know, the prime minister then was uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in his first turn as prime minister. He had two prime ministerial periods in his career, and um, he uh, uh, and so I'm sitting next to him on the dais. I was sitting the previous day next to Ehud Barak. We had all of these, so it really was kind of interesting. Um, one of the, uh, I want to tell funny stories. There was nothing really funny about um, about meeting with, uh, you know, but the event with Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, and, um, but but what we had to, we had to meet him in the, um, we're at the, what was then the uh, Hyatt Hotel, which has changed names now. It's in French Hill. It was the top hotel in Jerusalem for a while, but, after the first intifada, it be kind of became out of popularity because that was an area surrounded by Arab villages and people were a little bit afraid to go there. So they, it went from like a five and a half star hotel to, I think today it's a three star hotel. But that was really a beautiful hotel at the time. I had a couple of our Israel trips stay at that hotel. And we had to meet uh, Bibi Netanyahu in the kitchen of the hotel. Um, and because um, it was not long after the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, when nobody, no political leader in Israel would ever see a hotel lobby again. Uh, but the, um, one of the, um, we met the, um, one of our speakers was the minister of tourism and who became um, the president of Israel. And in a senior moment, and there'll be a few of those tonight, I'm just blanking on his name, but he was, a, I think one of the first Sephardi presidents of Israel. It will come to me shortly but probably better that I don't remember his name. Um, he, cause he ended up in jail uh, for um, things that we shouldn't talk about, but you know, in, in things that were really very inappropriate behavior, let's put it that way. Um, and uh, as the, Nathan Sharansky once said in Israel, in, in the Soviet Union, first you went to jail, then you went into government. In Israel, first you go into government and then you go to jail. So that was the, that was the case here with uh, um, the name that I'm just blanking on it, uh, but I'm probably blanking on it for a reason as I tell you the story. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you. No, 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 it's not Katsir. No, no, he never went to jail. Um, no, it's not, no, it's not a friend. No, he, he never, he never went to jail. 
um um but um uh so uh he was trying to figure trying to remind me who the big and that you should know because he was minister of tourism then no not Navon. no 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 Navon was a wonderful man um i have a story about Navon also as a rabbinical student but that's another story he was a great he was a terrific guy this was somebody who was not he was minister of tourism first and um what I should do on the side is just Google presidents of Israel and I'll be able to tell you who it was. Maybe I should do that while I'm talking. Um, okay, presidents of Israel. Okay, and I'll tell you because I see people are really curious. I have uh, Moshe Katsav. Thank you, Moshe Katsav, yay. You win, you win the prize, thank you. So he was, pre- in 1998, he was minister of tourism. He was supposed to speak to us, to greet us, to bring us greetings prior to, uh, to dinner. He showed up 90 minutes late as we were about to have our major program. And the featured speaker was Ehud Barak, who was then the, um, uh, he was the opposition leader, very significant politician. I'm sitting at the, at the dais next to him and, and then he walks in to bring us greetings. And his greetings are, it's extending into half an hour. 30, 35, he does, he's not stopping. So Rabbi Joel Myers comes, taps me on the shoulder. He was our executive director behind. He says, you got to stop him. Ehud Barak is in the kitchen. <laughs> you got to get him off the dais. So what do I do on this young rabbi? And I'm, what am I, how do I, this because the minister of tourism is, you know, who eventually I didn't know he would be president of Israel and go to jail. But the, so he, um, so what do I do? So I write him a note in Hebrew. Kavod hasar tzarich ligmor. You know, Mr. Minister, you have to finish. I hand him this note. So he finishes like in, in a minute or two. And he heads off. He leaves the dais. He lodges an official complaint with the uh, conservative movement, how he was so rudely treated by the chairman of the convention. And so Joel Myers comes laughing to me. He said, I had to throw you under the bus. I hope you don't mind. I said, well, it was the chairman's fault. I didn't tell him to do that. Of course, he did. But, so I, always, I, was, I was surprised that I was ever allowed back in the country because he, when he became president of Israel, um, that you know, I, I insulted him 15 years ago when I told him to finish his two-minute greeting after it extended 90 minutes late into uh, over half an hour. So that was one of the fun. There are many other stories of that experience. It's really a lot of fun to be in that situation. Um, as, um, and of course we had eight, everyone, as I said, that Barack was upset because he ended up getting on the dais 45 minutes late, our program ran two and a half hours late. So all, all of our rabbis, we, have, we had 600 rabbis there. They were all upset because the program went too long, uh, et cetera. But it was, it was a lot of fun. So I, I did this for relaxation. I didn't have, you know, I, I had, didn't have any enough stress as Rabbi Beth David. So I had to go elsewhere to find some stress. So one of the um, one of the things that I, I did do, and I'm not going to talk a lot about when I was president. I mean, it's not as interesting. That was uh, Brenda reminded me that uh, this week was the fifth anniversary of my being installed as president of the Rabbinical Assembly in New York. So um, you know, the first Canadian serving in Canada, et cetera, very exciting. Um, letter from the Prime Minister it was really wonderful. Um, but uh, that also came with a certain amount of aggravation, but some very good latkes at the White House during the Hanukkah receptions, um, and uh, my opportunity to have photo ops twice with Joe Biden, and you've seen those pictures floating in different places, and that was also five years ago, with the, just before I became president, when I was at the Rosh Hashanah reception at the, um, at, at, the pre, at the at the vice president's residence, then, which was absolutely amazing because every political leader was there. So I could say at the time, I've never met the mayor of Toronto, but I've met the, the vice president of the United States. I've met the uh, chief of staff of the president of the United States, Dennis Sandanu, who I had a long chat with because he, is a, he has 12 brothers who are priests and he was really fascinated by what a rabbi does. And uh, Jack Lou, Lu, who was the uh, secretary of the treasury who signed the dollar bills. I asked him if he'd sign Canadian dollar bills also, maybe they would be worth more. Um, and he asked me, what machsor do you use in shul? The chief, the secretary of the treasury of, uh, so when people thought that the Barack Obama was an anti-Semite, I said, well, you look at his cabinet, they all go to shul. I mean, what are you talking? But that wasn't, that's another, another story. So, um, 
one of the things I wanted to mention was one of the um, fun pieces of, uh, of being involved in the rabbinical assembly is I did something there that I also did in the shul. I had this mishigas that I liked to go to Israel when they were during bad times. It's like if we were able now, if we were able now, you know, if we were had our double vaccinations and we had our clear pass to be able to travel like they are in Israel and in some places in the US, if we were ahead of the game more than we are, and I could get on a plane, I'd love to get on a plane to Israel now and visit after a tough time. I did that several times over, over the years. Uh, one of the most memorable was during the Gulf War when uh, I, I did a, I, I ran a long distance campaign um, to raise money from Beth David to supply track suits, which are called in Hebrew training gym for families that were scudded out in Ramat Gan, which a suburb of Tel Aviv that was hit by a lot of scud missiles in 1991. And they had to quickly go to shelters and people had to be able in the middle of the night to go to a safe room. And um, they uh, were, they had to be going to sleep in, in clothes that could be then viewed in the public. So people wanted track suits. So through Beth David, we found a kibbutz that manufactured training gamer track suits. We were able to raise funds to purchase several thousand track suits that were distributed throughout Ramat Gan. This is in 1991. And I discovered going through my files in the office, uh, the letter of thank you from the mayor of Ramat Gan uh, and uh, Mayor Barr. And uh, I also had a letter of uh, thanks from the mayor of Tel Aviv, uh, Chich Lah Lah uh, Lahat, who I, I, I had occasion to meet both of them, a letter of thank you to our congregation and community. So thousands of people who were had to run to a, uh, to a, a safe room uh, in, during scud attacks, uh, so they were called sealed rooms at that point because you go with gas masks and they were sealed so not, no potential uh, poisonous gas could penetrate from outside. Thankfully, there were no occurrences of that, but that was the fear with the scud attacks. And um, so thousands of people were able to be able to go to sleep in track suits like many of us have done during COVID and which we wear 24 seven, that's another story. And um, that was one of the one of I think if I think of one of my most proud accomplishments in the Ravenet was that that uh, yeah, that event. So a couple of uh, sidebars from that particular story. Um, I also felt that I wanted to encourage other people to visit Israel during difficult times. I should say that those were the most meaningful visits. I mean, I, I every visit to Israel like 50, 60 times. I long to, I lost count. But those are the times when tourists are not there that you feel you're really doing something. And uh, when I brought it, we had one mission, one of our up to 20 Beth David trips over the years to Israel. One mission went during a time of intifada when nobody was traveling to Israel. And I thought, maybe I'll see if I can get a group. I normally would get 20 to 30. I got 12 people. We had 12. It was the largest Jewish mission in Canada, I believe, of that year. Um, Federation couldn't get a mission going at that time. We had 12 of our Beth Davidites get on a minibus and we traveled the country. And everywhere we went and people who were on that mission came back and they said it was the most amazing experience because everywhere we went, people hugged us. They said, thank you for coming. We feel so alone. Thank you for being there. And that was, again, it was incredible. You just, you felt, you know, you... <laughs> That we were just felt so privileged to be there and they felt we were doing a great, we felt we were having a great time. Uh, so, uh, so I'll tell you one funny story from this and I'll, then I'll extend it back to the rabbinical assembly. Uh, we had, um, I promised the families were, of people who went from our shul were nervous that, you know, their kids were saying, yeah, what are you going, are you crazy? You know, how do you go to Israel? And I said, we're going to go, Rabbi Shalom, we're going to go. So, I made it, I, I promised to some who spoke to me who were nervous. I said, okay, we're not going to go to the center of town. You know, we're not going to go out of our way to go. We're going to be going to doing safe stuff and we're going to really be. So, you know, we're, we're going to let people, you know, we're, we're going to, we're, we're going to be careful. Don't worry about it. So at one point I decided that, you know, we never did anything as a group in Merkaz that you're in the center of Jerusalem, because that's where there were a few incidents. But I said, you know, I'm crazy. You're not. 
you know, you could stay at the hotel, you do what you want, you can have some free time, you can have lunch in the hotel cafeteria. I'm going to Burger King on Ben Yehuda for lunch. I mean, it's not classy, but a kosher Burger King is really exciting. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to have lunch at Burger King, like whatever time, 12 noon, I'm going to be on Ben Yehuda. I'm not asking you to come because it is the center of town. And, you know, people are afraid to go to the center of town, but I'm going to go because I'm crazy. So if you want to join me, I'll be there. Lo and behold, the whole group showed up. Individually, but eventually we had the entire 12 people seated at a large table. And we, we enjoyed those whoppers or whatever they were called uh, in, immensely. It was very exciting. And of course, but every one of us as crazy as I was. A similar thing happened when I, I, I took a, I organized two rabbinical assembly missions to Israel during a subsequent intifada when there was no tourism. And um, I got, in one case, about 25 rabbis to go. And another one, we had about 20 to 30 rabbis. And United Synagogue had tried but didn't succeed in getting it. A, a United Synagogue mission, but they joined with us. So we had some lay people and rabbis, but it was basically the people that I got that made that mission as well. So there were two times we went. And the same thing would happen. I, it, was, it was really, I found it hilarious because I'd have rabbis talking to me calling me who were very scared about going. And I said, look, I'm a mental case. I've been there twice during a divad. It's been the greatest experience of my life, but I can't tell you to go. I'm saying that I, I, will, I have zero hesitation and the place I feel the least fear in the world is being in Israel, especially at a time like this. I felt no fear in Israel from the moment I landed to the moment I left. Um, I felt more fear in Toronto than I feel in Israel. But I can't tell you to go, but they all came. And they all would get up and thank me at the end for pushing them to come. And, and again, we had things like that, that, you know, we would say that, you know, I would say I did the same thing. I said, we're going to, I'm going to, I think that it was Colonel Sanders or something, other like ridiculous kosher place that normally would be trafe. And we're going to meet in the center of town if anyone wants to join me. So eventually, you know, they all come, <laughs> including those people who were the most fearful about going because you all get there, you, the fear is gone. And everybody thankfully returned safely. So we never had a problem in any of those missions. So one of the uh, one of my, my scattered recollections are doing these missions when other people were not going. I have to tell you something though, that that's something which I felt really good about taking my 12 people, but there was a Christian mission on the same flight with about 200 people. Jews were not going to Israel, but the Christians were. And, that, and that's why I felt it was really important for us to go as well. And people there really felt the uh, how important it was. I remember when we had our 20, 25 rabbis on one of our rabbinical assembly missions, we had we arranged a meeting with Israeli rabbis in one of our congregations. And we walk into the uh, sanctuary of that shul. Uh, it was the one, I believe, in uh, Talpiot Mizrach. Uh, and um, we, it was Rabbi Galinkin shul, Rabbi Reuven, late Rabbi Reuven Hammer shul. And all of our Jerusalem rabbis were meeting us there. And uh, it was really, it was very powerful because the 20 of us, 25 of us, we walk in and they're all hugging us and crying because again, they felt very alone. And uh, so if you ever had that opportunity, um, and again, I, I have to tell you, Brenda would kill me, but I have to tell you that if I, uh, <laughs> she's on the, she might come on that because she's on the, on this uh, Zoom. Um, if I had, if I were able now, if it were possible, that's where I'd be. Uh, because it just, it, it, it's such a sense of, of needing to sometimes show that our brothers and sisters in Israel are not alone. And again, that would be, if I were to say, what are some of the highlights for me of these 40 years? It was the opportunity both to take people to Israel, to be a leader within the rabbinical assembly in terms of Israel involvement, and, um, and to um, have those opportunities to really make, I think make a difference. And I, I really sense it did. And I just remember the reaction of people uh, on, who went on, the, on those crazy missions that people would not be expected to go. And, and, and how they felt this was the, the experience of their lifetime. And, and I, I still feel that way. I would never, that time when I, by the way, when I was in 1991, and I guess you're talking now, it's the, uh, how many years is that? It's, um, 30 years ago, we just had the, this, you know, it's 30, uh, exactly 30 years ago. And um, I didn't been, I'd been here at the show 10 years at that point. But when, uh, when um, you know, that, uh, I'm not going to say there weren't a lot of tourists. There were no tourists in Israel, then. like no, no, except this Michigan. And um, the uh, I was at the Sheraton Hotel in Tel Aviv, and the Plaza Hotel in Jerusalem. They've all changed names about seven times since then. But 
they they closed their cafeterias because there were no tourists, there was nobody there. The only people in these hotels were, were journalists. And so they had a sign up, dear tourists, and tell you where you could get breakfast. It was going to be in what they had a, a bar that was open, you could go for breakfast. So I joke with them, I said, it should say dear tourist, because I think I was the only tourist in the hotel, which normally would have hundreds of tourists, of course. Um, and um, one story that I've told the, that I, I, one of my favorite stories of that trip in 1991 was uh, when um, uh, we had, um, there were four times, when, you know, while during that trip, I think only four, four or five times when there was a, a middle of the night siren, when you had to go to the sealed room, you had to jump out of bed and go to the sealed room with your mask, with your gas mask. And at the airport, you come in, they gave you a mask, and then you give it back when you left the country. Uh, and um, so it's two o'clock in the morning. I'm, I get up in the middle, you know, the, the siren wakes me up, and I know they, they tell you where you have to go. So there's a sealed room on the, there was only one floor in the hotel that was open. The hotel of 20 floors, one floor was on the floor that was open, whatever floor, I don't remember. And so I go into the sealed room. So I'm alone in this room, the only tourist. And there were eight or nine Israeli beauty queens because they were doing a photo shoot for a beauty magazine in the hotel. And they were all in their night clothing. And I'm sitting in this room, you know, rabbi sitting with all of these beauty queens. Um, I guess I made the trip worthwhile. But it was, and, and the thing was, unfortunately, we got the all clear. It was too quick. I wanted to go on longer because the size you could be two hours in the sealed room. But this one was only 20 minutes. And I was really disappointed. I was hoping it would go for much longer. It didn't. But that was one of my great stories of, uh, of, of, of being in Israel during the Gulf War. People thought I was suffering and I was scared and it was, it was at the time of my life. Um, but that was, you know, you kind of do these crazy things and, and unusual things do happen. And that was one of the interesting memories. I didn't even put that on my notes because I just reminded myself of that experience. Um, as, I, as I'm talking to you. So uh, what else do I want to talk about? You know, I've, um, I'm going to actually, I don't know, it's, I think I've probably talked enough. So I'm going to see if, if, um, we, if any of you have questions you want to ask me about, um, you know, I'm talking about scattered recollections and memories of, of, uh, of the years and of the past, a bit about my early beginnings and my trepidation starting out in this, in this um, uh, field. Uh, I should tell you, like, as I began talking about a funeral, and uh, let me just folk, finish my my remarks by saying something about that, that, you know, because that's, again, something that I've done a lot of over the decades, as I've mentioned. Um, but the, what's the difference, though? Um, yeah, I don't want to give the impression that you become complacent. It never, it, it, it never becomes easy, because it's not easy to be with people at the often the worst moment of their lives. It's, it's very, you know, it's painful, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, and there are funerals that are, I had one again this week that was horrible, that was terribly tragic. I've had a couple this year that have been like, that, I, you know, that were just awful in terms of, of the level of tragedy that, that struck a family. And um, those are, you know, all, so that never gets easier. But what happens is that you go in and, you know, as a, when you have experience, you kind of, you don't have the same nervousness because you know what you're doing. In other words, you have, and I suspect I haven't really asked the question. I could ask the question of surgeons, of dentists, of anybody who does something, you know, where it can cause pain to another person. The first time you do it, I imagine there are, one gets a bit nervous. And that was certainly the same. So you don't have the, you have the confidence that you know you can do this, but it doesn't mean that it's easy. It doesn't mean that it's easy. It still is something that's difficult and painful, but you kind of figure out, you know, what needs to be said and what needs to be done. And I think primarily in, in those cases, the real message is how little needs to be said, how little needs to be said, because um, the, the error is trying to say too much. In, I began, I'll end with the idea of, you know, 2,300 funerals. I've never theologized any with, with the family, unless they've asked me theological questions. Occasionally, I'm asked at a shiva. Uh, I'm asked occasionally. Um, 
what happens to the body after death according to Jewish tradition. And I studied that and I'm interested in that. So I'll talk about Jewish views of eschatology, the end of days and, and the resurrection of the dead. I'll talk about it, but I don't go in and offer it unless someone asks because I don't know if that's really what people need to hear at that time. They just want you to listen to them. They're not looking, um, you know, they don't want theology unless they ask for it. And then I'm happy to give it. I love theology. But I don't go in and I, I don't want to preach to people. I don't think that's a time that people want to be. I think they want to be heard. They want to be listened to. Um, I'm kind of good at, um, you know, I, I can meet with a family and then, and often that means, then sometimes it's been a case where when we had the use of the chapels, when I'd meet with the family live in person and not by phone or by Zoom now, which we're doing the last year plus. And um, I, often it would work out because of timing that I would want an 11 o'clock funeral, I'd be meeting the family at 1030 at the chapel, listening to them, make a few notes, but I really I probably didn't even look at my notes. But the trick was that I, the way we, I was able to pull off because I just learned how to listen. I just had to hear what they were saying and then I'd kind of, if I were the speaker, and that isn't as much the case these days as it used to be. But if I were the speak, you know, basically it just kind of finding a way to reframe their words in a way that can be comforting. And then they say, Rabbi, it's like you knew him. It's like you knew her. And I hear that, we hear that all the time. And, oh, and I'd say, it just meant that I just listened to you. And that's, I think, the message, not just for rabbis, but anybody that's dealing with people in a challenging situation. God, I can we all listen, not to talk. They don't want to just listen. And the, the listening is much more important than the talking. Um, and uh, that I found, and, I, you know, and, and I've, that's been my focus. And I'm, I'm very non-preachy in, in, in those uh, in those situations. I did tell you, and I'll end with something funny about a funeral. I said I did there occasionally funny funerals. And um, and I thankfully don't remember her name here. And if I did, I wouldn't mention it. But it was one of those cases where, you know, since occasionally I would be called to officiate at a, a funeral of somebody not affiliated with the synagogue. A lot of the, you know, that frequent, a lot of half of the Toronto population of Jews is not, are not affiliated with synagogues. So that, you know, and then they go through a rotation, they call different rabbis, so I'm called to do a funeral for a certain gentleman. And um, the, uh, so I get there and I say, is there anyone in the family? There's no family. The only person here is his ex-wife. So, okay, I, mean, it's, I guess I'm not going to give a big eulogy for this one person and it's somebody who obviously is not still really in love with him, I would assume. But I, can I talk to her? So I, heard, oh, what the, I go talk to her and I say, Mrs. Goldberg, I don't know what, what her name was. And I said, uh, I didn't know if I should say my condolences or not. You know, but I said, um, sorry about the passing of <clears throat> so-and-so. Uh, what can you tell me about him? So she said, he should burn in hell. So <laughs> I said, well, that's helpful, but... Um, is there anything before that happens? Is there anything you can show? And then she said, no. And then I find out that he was, you know, that one of his issues was he was a, um, uh, he was a, a serious alcoholic and a very serious, and that probably led to the break of their marriage and other problems. But that's also, I really did not give a eulogy as you can understand. I wasn't going to get up and say that, uh, talk about what should happen to him in his afterlife and uh, what the temperature should be. Uh, in that situation. So I, I decided to skip that eulogy. Um, but the, the irony was that, and I remember the day of the year that that funeral took place and for the following reason, it was December 24th, happens to be my birthday. And the director at Benjamin's who I was friendly with, gave me a bottle of wine as a gift for that service. So I said, well, maybe it'll be appropriate that I should bring that bottle out and drink from it during the funeral because it would kind of fit the story, but I decided I chose not to do that. So that's my I had one comical, I don't have too many comical funerals. I probably have a few others I could think about, but that was, um, you know, that was one of my better funeral stories. Not always easy to be a rabbi, um, but usually it is. And I, I guess if I'm gonna do a summation, I said I would take questions. Um, and uh, oh, I see Paul asked me a question. I will take the question from the chat in a moment. One of the, um, uh, you know, things that I would say is that, uh, uh, you know, I, I felt that I learned a lot in, in those situations and uh, they weren't, um, and, and sometimes, you know, 
sometimes they're you know out of bad comes good and there's you know there are healing moments that families have at, at those times but not always but uh, a lot of the uh, of a rabbi's time is in sad circumstances we're not always doing weddings and bar mitzvahs and baby namings those are wonderful but we're not always doing those um and uh Nonetheless, it's uh, you do. Uh, it can be enriching in certain in certain ways, even though they can be difficult. So Paul is asking me, "What exotic places did you visit when I was part of the conference of presidents of major Jewish organizations?" And the the classic example of that's a great question. I didn't want to go into that tonight, but that uh, when uh, in I guess four years ago now, three years ago, maybe three years ago, my second year as president of the RA. Every year, there's a, a, a when you're a president of the rabbinical assembly, it's considered one of the major American Jewish organizations. So you're part of what's known in short as the president's conference, the conference of presidents of major Jewish organizations that was led then by Malcolm Howe Homeline, who spoke in our shul a couple of years back. Um, and all of the, the leaders of all of the major Jewish organizations. And that's where you get to the White House and to things like that and meet with uh, interesting people. Um, but um, the highlight of that year, my second year was we had a trip to the Emirates to Abu Dhabi and uh, Bahrain, and uh, not Bahrain, but Abu Dhabi and uh, Dubai, uh, which I, I think I talked about when I got back uh, three years ago, which was a lot, it was a blast. And that's again, when, when the uh, Abraham Accords happened last year, or the last, you know, I was not surprised because every speaker, we met with all of the leaders of, of Abu Dhabi, which are really the leaders of the country. There's no, there's no king, but there are these brothers, they're all sheikhs. And each one of them takes a different emirate. They're different emirates. That's the Dubai is an emirate. Abu Dhabi is an emirate. And the United Emirates, uh, it, this, I think there's seven of them. And most of them are led by sons of the founding king of, um, of, of uh, the emirates. And uh, we met with all of them in different places. So a couple, there's some great experiences of that trip. One was when we were, um, when we were in... Um, uh, in Abu Dhabi, we were met with uh, the head honcho. I mean, the guy who's quoted now is the one who's really the leader of the country, even though, but he's just a sheikh, but he's really the leader of the country. And they all have, I couldn't pause his name, he has like 19 different names. Um, but we walk in and they explain that, and, you know, we're kosher, so we've already eaten. We had to, you know, we can come, we can have tea. So we walk into, they take us into this reception, this palace, where we thought we were back at the time of the of Purim in Shushan, where they had these enormous vats of food. And like, and, and they were, it was that we've never seen anything like this in our lives and they were expecting us to eat. They said, it's okay, it's only camel. You can eat it, it's camel. And we're all chalashin, you know. They were not everyone in the group was kosher. It's not a, you know, it's not a religious. There are, they were observed from juice as part of this, but so we're all like, Picking around, we're not eating the camel, of course. I think we found a, I found a vegetable or something, which I looked at for a, a while, and said the drink was camel milk. Whatever the, they find more uses for a camel than any place in the world in the Emirates. I mean, whatever you want to do with a camel, they they do it. But it was, you know, it was okay. It was kosher because it was camel. Um, it was some kind of, but it was hilarious to see that. I, mean, I was talking to Malcolm, we were laughing. He said, "I was just Shushan, and we're in Borm." I mean, it's like this kingly feast. It was hilarious. So that was the kind of um, experience that, uh, that, that we had treated exceptionally well. And every speaker spoke very positively about Israel. That's why it was no surprise to me that they were going to establish rule. They wanted to. They were hesitant because the Saudis were next door. They were afraid of the Saudis. But obviously, the Saudis winked and said, go ahead. You can do it. You can, um, uh, you can. Um, you know, have a relationship with Israel and the Saudis at some point will as well, I imagine. Because they were already feeling, they were, they were really identifying with Israel. They were, they want to build a strong economy. Uh, one story that I did share, I think when I got back, but you will not all have heard it, was they took us to the um, campus of NYU in Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi is an, I recommend this trip. I mean, the truth is, I had the chance, I mean, I, I would take a mission to Abu Dhabi to the, the Emirates and to Israel at some point. It'd be very expensive, but it's a, it, the Emirates are it's beautiful. I loved it there, actually. Um, I went to Tim Hortons in the Dubai Mall, and just because I could go to Tim Hortons, and uh, I walked to order. It was like a thousand degrees, so I ordered their ice cream coffee drink, whatever they call it, I forget. And I, 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 I forgot, I started ordering it in Hebrew. I forgot that I wasn't in Israel. It's sort of embarrassing. But 
the um the, the they were treated exceptionally well and they let us they they cushered the um uh, Fer, the the uh fairmont hotel in abu dhabi for us they cushered the kitchen for our group uh, they brought in a mashkiach from south africa and they cushered one of the restaurants at the uh, in dubai one of the most popular restaurants they closed it for three days to kosher it they imported kosher meat from south from south africa it was unbelievable what they did for us and they were just so nice and so welcoming and so pleasant. It was really, a, it, was, it was quite the, uh, the amazing experience. Um, so uh, that's one of my more, more exotic and unusual um, experiences, including some of the political stuff we did. Again, the White House stuff was fun. And I know that I was able to say that I've met the president of the United States, the vice president of the United States. I'd never met the mayor of Toronto. That I met the mayor of Toronto, so I couldn't say that anymore. But it was, I had an invitation <laughs> when I was invited to the White House for Hanukkah in my second year as president of the RA, my first year, the second year it was Trump. We didn't invite anybody who wasn't uh, Chabad. But when I was, my first year, the, uh, and the year before I was invited, when I was vice president, in my first year as president, when I was invited to the White House in the Biden administration, in the uh, Obama administration, um, that um, the, um, I, I received uh, before going, like two weeks before I had the, the invite to the White House, I received an invite to go to Queens Park uh, to the um, Ontario legislature the same night. So I had to choose when I go to the White House or when I go to Queens Park. I apologize that I went to the White House instead of Queens Park. But that was, uh, yeah. um, you know, I, 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 um, I had to make that a tough, tough decision. It was really hard. But uh, so that was the weird thing. And, and they, Malcolm Homeland said to me that whenever every place we went, I said, what's this Canadian doing here? It's supposed to be the president of American Jewish organization. So it's because they have all these American passports and one Canadian passport. So what's this Canadian doing here? So he's like, he got lost. Don't worry about it. So um, there was a, that was kind of kind of cool and, and kind of unusual. Um, and uh, but it was fun. So let me um, take a couple of moments. We've already gone over time. OK, here. And he asked me the craziest wedding or bar mitzvah story. Um, well, okay, wet, I'll give it crazy wedding. I mean, that's not necessarily, you know, I had a wedding. They weren't members of Beth David, but this was a time we used to have non-member weddings. But we don't have too many weddings. It's just the nature of weddings has, has changed and very few take place in shuls these days. Um, but we had a we met wedding in the shul many years back. Many years, maybe 15, 20 years ago. And um, I was, uh, we had, this was a time in between canters where we had no, so we had to use guest canters to do weddings. I think I had canter superior lovers. He was, I had him officiating with me. He was, we were both in the shul. Wedding was supposed to start at um, say six o'clock. It was a Sunday wedding. Um, and I normally would be, seeing the couple 20 to six, like 50, 20 minutes before to do the Badekin. And so the consultant, they're not ready. Okay, they're not ready. Um, so it's 10 to six, five to six, six, they're not ready. And so I go, and I, both of us had other weddings that night. I had, a, I had to go to a home to do a wedding Schedule, I think, for 7.30. And Cantor Sapir had a wedding at Beth Tikva at 7. And it's coming at 6.05, 6.10, and they're still not ready. So I go, to go, what's going on here? We both have to leave. And the consultant says, they're having a big fight. They may be breaking up. This is very serious. So I, you know, I said, well, at some point, they're going to have to decide because we got to go elsewhere. They'll have a choice of they're either going to, you know, have a wedding or not. Just let me know. I mean, I can't stay here for three hours. Cantor Superior at like 6.20 had to leave because so it was just me. They no longer had a canter. Finally, they, they made up. And the wedding started like at 10 to 7. And I had to do the fastest wedding ever because I had to be out of here to get to my other wedding. And I wasn't going to punish them because of this. So that was like the shortest wedding in the history of the Jewish people. Um, they finally decided, I have no idea what happened to them. Um, maybe they the happiest marriage and 23 children at this point. I have no idea. Never saw them again, never heard from them again. But that was one of the more um, 
you know, I've had weddings where, where, where the groom was late and the groom was ready to start, the groom hadn't shown up, hadn't arrived yet. So all these things do happen. Um, but most, most weddings tend to be normal and okay and, 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 and conventional, but these things uh, do happen. Um, bar mitzvahs, um, I don't have, unfortunately, I don't really have any great horror stories about, <laughs> about bar but mitzvahs. I have my great baby naming story, which I may have told before. Some of you may remember this, but this is a long time ago, where, you know, we traditionally, when we had live baby namings before COVID, we called the parents to come forward with the baby to the Bima. So this was a um, summer wedding, a summer baby naming. And um, the mother of the baby comes in with the baby and the um, for some reason, the father wasn't there, or just the mother was there. And I don't remember what the story was with the father. But let me put it this way. The mother was not dressed appropriately for the beach. Um, she was not in a state of dress that I could bring her onto the bima. She was not in a state of dress that she should be in the shul. Um, it was like, I mean, she was not an unattractive woman. I mean, all the a lot of the congregants kind of were pleased by this, but it was really so quick. You have to say, make these quick judgment calls. Well, what do I do? How can I, I can't have the baby come up herself. That would be hard because she's two months old. Um, do I go get, the, you know, there wasn't very, like a couple of relatives there. Do I have, what do I do? So we created a new custom for that Shabbat, whereas instead of the mother coming to, you know, the baby, to the, bring the baby up to the rabbi. The rabbi went down to the mother. So I went down to the, I got descended from the beam and walked over and did the naming, kept her in her seat. But that's one of the more memorable baby naming memories that I have. But uh, you kind of sometimes, you know, and I'd be flexible. I'm not with shoulders uncovered. I'm going to care. I'm not going to worry. But this was not a case where I could bring, it was just not, this was like, there was no, this was not a difficult call that this was not going to work. This was not bima appropriate clothing. It was not shul appropriate clothing. It was, I'm, again, I'm not sure it was beach appropriate clothing. Even there, it would have raised eyebrows. But sometimes, you know, um, I mean, most people have some sense of judgment and they have a sense of how you dress appropriately or moderately appropriately. Um, and, and it sometimes gets violated. But like people ask me doing a wedding, can I, um, you know, the bride, you know, the question, the bride question that I would get all the time. And I, even before I have a question for you, so I, uh, did the bridesmaids have to have their shoulders covered? I know that's the question, and it's always the question. And I, my answer is, I couldn't care less. And why do I say I couldn't care less? I'll tell you why I say I couldn't care less. Yeah, if it's sanctuary, especially if it's in shul, and we don't have that many weddings in shul anymore, but if it's in shul, yeah, they're going in the ark, or they should, it's nice. They, but I did a, I attended a wedding as a guest at a kibbutz in Israel, officiated by one of the major ultra-Orthodox Haredi rabbis of Israel whose hat was bigger than a village, whose beard went down to the floor. His payas, like it could have uh, you know, been a fence around uh, uh, the entire kibbutz. Like, you know, this, you look up from Yid and this guy's pictures. I mean, the firmest rabbi I've ever seen in my life. He's officiating. The bride is half naked. The bridesmaids are half naked. And I said, it's good enough for him. It's good enough for me. I'm going to worry about the shoulders being covered. I mean, they're nowhere near as risque as this was. And this guy couldn't have cared less. He's doing the wedding. He's doing it. And, and there's, it was like, this was like a really great scene. This is like, could be a Saturday Night Live sketch. But, the, you know, this is something, you know, you have this like super pious rabbi and these semi-naked women standing around him. He's doing a ceremony. He probably liked it. But so at that point, I'd be, I'm going to worry about it. This guy's not worried. I'm not going to. So that's the question that I would always get. The shoulders have to be covered. And I couldn't care less. And that, you know, you know, I said, they can be tasteful. You'll be tasteful. I'm fine. You know, I trust you'll be tasteful. But that was the, um, <laughs> that, that, those are some of the, I don't, I don't have a lot of, of crazy wedding or bar bar mitzvah stories. Bar bar mitzvah, I can't think of anything. Um, and uh, really that, you know, those tend to be conventional. I, I, I'm sure I'll get off the Zoom and I'll think of something totally crazy. But I can't think of maybe if there's one more question of uh, I'll see if I'm looking in the chat for questions. 
Um, but if not, that's uh, I think Jerry is giving us the baseball score, which I guess is a good thing because your Jays stink. Um, so hopefully they're going to do better, but that's off topic. Um, so, uh, okay. Um, what I will say is that uh, I, um, I hope that you found some of these uh, recollections. I mean, they were scattered. I told you this is going to be, I'm just taking things from all over the place. I didn't, this wasn't really organized uh, historically or chronologically, but just various memories and recollections. And as I go through, as I disassemble my, my offices, home and, 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 and stu and shul, and prepare for you know moves. Um, I um, I have um, basically uh, um, I've, I've, I've uncovered things, you know, like the letter from uh, Mayor Barr of, of Ramat Gun that I forgot about. I found that letter, various things that relics of the past that I discovered. That, oh yeah, I remember that. Things that I had that I had not thought about for a long time. I'm sure more of those will come out. And if I ever do any kind of memoir writing, and I'm not promising you that I'm going to do that because I can't, the good, the juicy stuff I won't be able to say. But nonetheless, um, I think of things that uh, there were a lot of, uh, of uh, humorous occasions down the road, a lot of things, a lot of memories, a lot of very sad memories, a lot of very emotional memories, but a lot of fun memories as well. Um, and uh, oh, Marion, that's really sweet. Marion Tully just put on the chat. I was on the search committee 40 years ago. I'm glad I said yes. So that's really very nice. Let me, that reminds me of, I should tell you a, a, another memory that just comes to mind because of what Marion just said, uh, which was very sweet. When, uh, and that, um, you know what happened in my, when Rabbi Papenheim passed away, the shul had to make a decision. And my assumption at the beginning was that they would because the RA at that point would not allow me to take a shul of our size, I was too young. And they changed the rule, they modified the rule after, the, you know, after a long debate and process to allow me to stay, to grandfather me into the congregation, but then change the policy. But Beth David had to decide whether they wanted to go with a young rabbi. And it would be very legitimate to, um, uh, to, to, to decide to go a different direction. So they had a meeting, a, a leadership meeting in the library, um, which, by the way, happens to be adjacent to my office. And I heard everything that went on in that discussion. They'd, I'm sitting in my office and a member who I knew very well, who I love, by the way, said, he's too young, he's a kid, you have to get him an older rabbi. So I, and I never told him that I heard that, but I knew who said it. But it's somebody with whom I've had a very close relationship over the years. So I guess at some point he said, I guess it was okay, they stuck with the kid. But I did feel that that was a legitimate response because I felt at the beginning that that, that that choice would not have been made. Um, because it would, the, the shul had options. And I already assumed that I'd have to be looking for another position because I was 29, 30 years old at the time, a bit young to take on a, uh, an 1100 family congregation. It was just, uh, you know, that was going to be, you know, I, I totally understood that and I would not have been resentful, but they, you know, whatever, he decided it was easier. I was already here. You didn't have to bring in another rabbi, you know, you, you, I was here, it was the middle, and uh, you somehow stuck with that decision, but it was, I didn't, I never took that for granted. But I remember that I always laughed because no one knew that I heard that. But I, I, I wasn't angry because I felt he was right. I mean, it was a legitimate point. It was a, a, a legitimate um, opinion to be expressed. And I, you know, and again, it's somebody who I knew who it was. It was a very distinct voice and somebody with whom I've had a great relationship over the years. But, um, and who never knows that I heard that. <laughs> so that was, it's always dangerous having a meeting in the office. In the, and, I, and I often, I try not to hear that stuff. Because it's, you know, you know, it was uh, when there were meetings, there would be meetings in that room right next to me. The walls are thin. And I, I, I found it to be a distraction. You know, you know I, I didn't want to hear. I didn't look to hear it, but I couldn't help it because it was like they were sitting in my office when they're having the meetings. Um, and uh, oh, so, Karen, that's a very nice comment. That's right. We did uh, a week in Israel together as well. And uh, when we were picking Shin Shinim, by the way, uh, you know that I'll just say, I'll end with this, that um, I'm now on the, I have a meeting Thursday. I'm on the board of governors of the uh, Jewish agency. And I'm on the, um, and the Jewish agency is the, they supervise the Shin Shinim program from Israel. It comes, emanates from them. And I'm on that committee that supervises the Shin Shinim now in Israel. So it's interesting. So I'll try to influence the next time Beth David has Shin Shinim that we send somebody good here. So... <laughs> Um, I will we'll see what happens, but that uh, just because Karen mentioned Shin Shinim. So I'm going to, um, I think I've, uh, I never, I'm in an hour and a quarter, I even thought that would go that long. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna pause and I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Demo 64. Very nice turnout. I expected fewer. So um, I'm very touched by the many of you who've come on tonight, and I'm sure we'll have other occasions in different settings to to chat and to reminisce and to talk. And I wish all of you well. I mean, we not see each other as frequently as we have in the past, but. Uh, I'm sure that we will have encounters and they, uh, you've left my, so all, all, virtually all of you at different places have left me with the uh, connection and memories that I will always cherish and uh, the good stuff and the, you know, that I've enjoyed these 40 years and I've enjoyed spending them with you guys. And I thank you all for being with, uh, with me tonight and being with each other. And I'm sure we will, uh, it's, this is Lee Trout, we'll see each other again whether that where that will be will will be determined, but it will uh, it will certainly happen, and I look forward to I will I look forward to that, and I wish all of you success. Uh, so thank you.